Hello everyone, my name is uh, Dr. Ben Berkham from Ohio Health uh, Non-Surgical Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. I have two uh, excellent co-hosts tonight, so we'll, we'll get to them here shortly. But welcome to the Ohio Health Knee Seminar, and the title you can probably see in front of you is uh, That Bad Knee Isn't Going to Fix Itself. So we're going to have some excellent discussions, uh, a few, uh, keep it brief and kind of to the point with a few uh, approximate 10 minute lectures to kind of uh, raise some awareness about uh, important points to know about knee management. Um, our three presenters, um, we have Michelle Lukey, who's going to speak on knee health and wellness, uh, as well as a new awesome initiative here at Ohio Health uh, called Take Control. It's an excellent program that uh, uh, she's coerced me into being involved in, we'll say, uh, and um, we'll talk about that more here shortly. Um, and then we'll, uh, I will give a brief talk about non-surgical management uh, of knee arthritis and other knee problems. And then we have the esteemed Dr. Lance Maynard, who will uh, give a talk about robotic-assisted knee replacement and just knee, knee replacement in general, probably surgical options for knee care. I think it's an excellent lineup, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. We already have some good questions coming in in the chat. Um, wanted to make sure that uh, everything you post in the chat is public for everyone to see, so make sure, please, please no personal or private health questions in the chat. Uh, there is an email, and this will be posted likely on the slides that you can see. The email is ortho, which is O-R-T-H-O, at ohiohealth.com. If you email your private personal information to that. Um, one of our staff will respond to you and try to get back to you in a relatively timely manner about any questions you may have. Um, there is also a scheduler available tonight if you would like to schedule an appointment specifically uh, regards to uh, tonight with Dr. Maynard or myself um, and uh, Michelle Lukey's program will have information to learn more about um, but we're not actively scheduling for that tonight. But um, there's a scheduler. I believe uh, JR, one of our uh, rock star athletic trainers from the Bone and Joint Center, uh, will be available to, uh, uh, to take your call and uh, give you a hard time because he's a, he's a funny guy. You'll like uh, speaking with him. But I believe that wraps up most of the introduction. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. So um, I'm going to introduce here Michelle Lukey again, speaking on the Take Control program and health and wellness here at Ohio Health. Go ahead, Michelle. Thanks, Dr. Berkham. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Michelle Lukey. I'm a nurse at the Bone and Joint Center. I'm an advisor to the orthopedic service line, and it's a pleasure to be speaking you, to you tonight in regards to our Take Control program. So what is Take Control, and what's the general theme of it? So if you know or do not know that in 2017 to 18, about 43% of Americans have been diagnosed with obesity. And obesity is associated with increased health and medical costs, decreased work productivity, and a poorer, poorer quality of life. So with that, a vision from one of our total joint surgeons, Dr. Earl Bartley, his thoughts were, we need to have a program that educates our patients about wellness and health that, in regards to patients who struggle with obesity and have joint pain. So Take Control is a five-week program. It's free and it's virtual via Zoom, the Zoom platform. And it's offering medical and non-surgical education in order to empower you, the patient, to take control of your overall health. So who's right for the Take Control program? The general audience is for adults who are about 40 to 75 years of age and who struggle with knee or hip or back arthritis and have pain. And we also are looking on a focus for those who are struggling with obesity. So a BMI greater than 45 deems you appropriate to motivate you to get you to improve your health without necessarily being a surgical candidate at that time. So some of the topics that we like to discuss in the five-week program, one of them is dietary supplements. So we have a pharmacist who speaks on dietary supplements. And one thing to recognize is about $2.1 billion a year are spent on di dietary supplements, which is a lot of money. So more women than men try, try that, and about 15% of adults have used weight loss supplements in the past. So we have a pharmacist who speaks about dietary supplements, what's good, what's bad, and also discusses other medication options for you during our session. 
We also have the arthritis talk, which is about time to get moving. So we have an exercise physiologist who talks through seated stretches, seating cardio exercises, how to do strength training when you're struggling with your weight and how to get mobility and movement within the arena of while you're ready to move and move yourself along. So did you recognize that one pound of weight loss can give you four pounds of stress relief on your joints? So that's really important to try to motivate you to get you moving, to get you better, and to help prevent um, increased um, immobility. One thing that we try to stress on and kind of what like to discuss is what if we don't change at all and something magically just happens that typically doesn't work. So we have a behavioral psychologist who also talks about your weight loss goals, establishing SMART goals, as so they're called. So eating healthier, increasing your activity, to stop smoking, all of those pieces and parts that help lead you to a healthier lifestyle. And then we have non-surgical options that Dr. Burkham, who will talk to, and he also talks during our take control session, and also surgical options are available. We utilize the Ohio Health Weight Management staff to give those information sessions, to give um, sessions in regards to dietitian and nutrition, and the other sessions that we just um, went through. And then also medical weight management program, it's comprehensive, it's a focus on diet and behavior modifications. So we want you to recognize that change is a process, it's not an event, it ha doesn't happen overnight. We want you to know that this program ha gives you an option to learn and educate yourself in regards to taking control of a better you. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Um, one thing I didn't see in there that I'd love, I'm sure some of the mm -hmm. people would be willing uh, or interested in is where do they learn more about this program? And there were a couple questions in the chat about is this entire program tonight just about people who are overweight with knee issues? Um, and uh, my talk, which is next just shortly, will have much about just general knee care. Um, the first talk here, Michelle, is kind of going through um, specifically people with that elevated BMI and programming available here at Ohio Health. But if they want to learn more, that's just to answer the questions in the chat. But for, for you, Michelle, what, uh, if they want to learn more, where do they find that information? How do they move so forward? In the chat, there should be a link to the brochure that gives you information in regards to the take control sessions. We are offering a take control session in September. They're quarterly sessions. You have to register, and we do try to limit the participation so that we can make it more personal and not have a large number of patients that we can address any questions that they have. So the link will be present in the chat to learn more about how to register. Excellent. Thank you. All a right. lot of great information. appreciate all, all right. your, uh, You're your insight. Um, all right. So we're going to move forward to the, the next talk. Um, I'm going to give a brief talk about just general knee arthritis. And for some of the people answer, asking questions, there was already a multiple good questions that I will try to address in my, my 10 minute presentation coming up. Um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, post in the chat. And uh, I'll try to answer all questions at the end. And Michelle's going to be following the chat closely, and she'll bring up any questions at the end that I need to address. So we're going to have the staff here move forward the slides to the, uh, the next lecture. So. Here's my basic information. So I'm going to speak on general knee arthritis and non-surgical solutions. Uh, again, I already said my name, uh, Ben Burkham, but uh, I am a team physician for the Columbus Blue Jackets, our, our awesome local hockey squad, as well as Hilliard-Davidson High School. Enjoy working with uh, some amazing teams there as well. So uh, I work mainly at the McConnell Spine Sport and Joint Center three days a week, but I'm also at the Bone and Joint Center, um, where I spend some time with Dr. Maynard and Michelle down there. It's an excellent facility and giving excellent orthopedic care for everyone at Ohio Health. Um, so we have many other centers. Uh, there's good orthopedics all spread around the Ohio Health facilities around. But if you need anything, that's where you can find some of the non-surgical options. I think one of the important basic things that I explain to knee pain patients daily is what is osteoarthritis? So I thought this kind of cartoon helped summarize some of this pretty well. So 
people always talk about, well, if I just have a bone spur, can't we just remove the bone spur? Can Dr. Maynard just take care of that for me? Um, and really, it's more than that, right? So this cartilage damage in the joint and the joint space narrowing where we slowly wear down the um, cushion in the knee really creates the discomfort and pain. And the bone spurs, as you can see in the, the picture that you have in front of you, that's not just, that's a sign of damage, but it's not actually what's always causing all of the pain. So what is knee arthritis? It is slow breakdown, usually over time, of the cartilage and cushioning inside the knee, and that can create pain and discomfort um, over time for individuals. So I break down in, um, knee arthritis management for, for all individuals into it's important to make sure our BMI is as close to possible, uh, or as close to normal as possible. As Michelle pointed out, there are many good statistics that show that our body weight significantly affects joint pain. So if you have a normal BMI, great. You know, we can move forward in the rest of the algorithm, as you can see all the different topics listed in front of you, the bullet points. But weight management is a major component that I always think needs to be discussed. Obviously, many of you with your primary care doctors or even just on your own will see that rest, you know, over-the-counter medicines such as Tylenol or anti-inflammatories, if you're allowed to take those, um, can be very beneficial in knee arthritis basic early management. Um, physical therapy or aqua therapy many times comes into play, and we can discuss those briefly if you'd like to. But tonight I'm going to really go through the injectable options because this is what a lot of people get referred to me for. Their primary care doctors will do some of the basics um, as you see listed in front of you. And then Dr. Maynard will speak on the last bullet point there about more of the surgical options. But I get many, many questions about the injectable options and there were multiple questions already in the chat about cortisone injections. I saw something about regenerative medicine like PRP and stem cell already in the chat and we'll go through those right now. First, over-the-counter medications. Tylenol is a standard of care, it is very, very safe, and is a kind of the go-to first-line over-the-counter medication by all orthopedic societies is recommended as an early mainstay of treatment. Anti-inflammatories, oral, and I think uh, an important thing always to remember is topical anti-inflammatories have a, definitely have a role in the management of knee osteoarthritis, um, but narcotics do not. Um, narcotics uh, are not recommended as part of the knee osteoarthritis management program. Um, and we can discuss why that is or is not in the beginning, but that is not a, a standard management um, part of the algorithm. So here is the list of injections that we discuss regularly in my office uh, as options for patients. So there's corticosteroids, which is what you hear about as cortisone injections or steroid injections. There are the visco supplements. That's what most people call, you've probably heard of the gel injections. Um, or uh, some people will discuss as a more of a lubricant injection, like WD-40 on a rusty hinge type injection. We can go through those here briefly. PRP and stem cell, we kind of group together as what's called regenerative medicine. Um, and both of these are excellent uh, options. We'll talk about the pros and cons of these. And then finally, as a non-surgical option, there is a nerve block procedure where if you're not necessarily a candidate for replacement at that time, a, a last resort as a possible option is actually a nerve block treatment where we can actually help reduce pain for the knees. So let's go briefly through these uh, individual injections and the pros and cons. So corticosteroids do have a clear role in acute or flare-ups or uh, acute word meaning brand new, like a very not a 10-year history of knee, but when you have a flare-up, let's say you go on a vacation with your family and you walk, or if you go on a hike and you really flare up that knee, a corticosteroid injection can clearly have some major benefits for getting you back to your normal routine, getting you into physical therapy and stabilizing the joint. However, there is evidence that some of the medicines we use to kind of numb the knee or do things have some toxicity to the joint. So um, I think someone earlier in the chat had said, how many knee injections can you have? And I think that's a, a very good question and something that we get commonly asked in the office. The answer is, is that we try to really avoid corticosteroid injections in young athletes or young patients because there is evidence that some of the medicines have a very low toxicity to the joint. So repetitive injections aren't great for the joint. If you have pretty significant arthritis or depending on your age, um, they can be done more frequently. So there is no one specific clear number of injections you can get. We should, we try to minimize them to at the earliest they can be done is every three to six months. I think annually or as far out as possible is ideal. Yes. Do you know what that is? Yes, yeah, so gel one is one of our commonly used visco supplements. 
Um, and uh, I will, uh, if there's something specific about Gel 1, we can talk about it. But um, the Visco supplements are the very next slide, okay, so I will get to good. it. So there is some mixed evidence um, on are, do the steroids themselves actually cause damage. It's very mixed. There's pros and cons. But overall, steroids do help reduce inflammation and joint pain. And can I've seen it over and over again, have very good help in getting the knee pain reduced so that we can get you into a program of physical therapy and improving your overall function and stability of the knee. So next, here's the uh, Visco supplement question that you said. And uh, I, Synvisc, Uflexa, and that et cetera up there at the top of the screen is for Gel 1 and some of the other brand names. There are so many these days. Some of the more common ones you've heard, Synvisc has been around forever um, and has been one of the gold standards for a very long time. But uh, we're not going to get into all the different brands here tonight and just talk about Visco supplements in general. But, I mean, there's, this is from a, a, a well-respected review article uh, that they go through about all the different options and reviewed everything. And that, that, that definitely provides, um, they say, visco supplementations provide pain reduction and improvement in physical function with very low risk of harm. So there are, it is, all these different types of injections have pros and cons. Um, and I always tell people it's patient selection, right? Uh, I really think that is key here. There are reasons to do this, and it's very important that you talk to your doctor about, is this an option for you? Most insurance companies do not cover visco supplements until you have done physical therapy, you've worked on weight loss, you've had likely had at least one cortisone injection, and you've not had proper improvement. So visco supplements are routinely covered by insurance, but there are certain things you need to talk to your specific doctor about to make sure you've done all the right things and see if this is right for you. So we'll get to the PRP and stem cell injections, which are considered regenerative injections. PRP is really the up and comer in the knee osteoarthritis injection kind of pathway, if you will. PRP uh, is, stands for platelet-rich plasma. It is a blood draw. So we would draw the patient's blood. We have you stay there at the office and you would spin it down to get the, the, these healing cells, the growth factors and uh, proteins in our own blood that help us heal are attached to these platelets. So we can concentrate it down and inject it into the knee that same day. It's an excellent procedure. We are um, concentrating it down eight to ten times as you can see there as a standard goal. Uh, we also, there's some mixed evidence for other uses in tendons and other areas of the body. Um, PRP is being pushed forward for knee arthritis to be covered by insurance. This is in the works, but this still is an out-of-pocket cost. Um, and something you can discuss. Um, PRP is a little bit cheaper than stem cell injections. Stem cell injections, which is our next slide, are either harvested from bone marrow, so where we tap into the bone and actually draw some of that fluid off of the bone itself and concentrate that into the same kind of stem cell formula where we can inject into the joint. There are other new ways where we uh, harvest adipose tissue and then inject those cells as they get concentrated down into the joint. Both of these have shown, shown some benefits in knee, but I always get the question about what are we allowed to do? Internationally, some people will travel for some of these injections because in the United States, we are only allowed limited manipulation of the cells. There are other places internationally that can do more manipulation and there's maybe some added benefits, but there's some ethical dilemmas there about manipulating human cells and human tissue. So sometimes it gets a little controversial. There is an out-of-pocket cost for stem cells that varies uh, facility to facility, um, but we'll leave that alone for now. But PRP is growing because it's a little bit cheaper and very effective. Stem cells do have show evidence for benefits in knee osteoarthritis, but I would again say this is patient selection, just like with the Visco supplements. And Dr. Maynard can chime in uh, during his lecture about his uh, opinions if, if he has time. So we're, yes, of course any history of like any comorbidities or a medical history that a patient doesn't qualify for PRP is one of our questions. Good question. So I tell patients bone on bone knee arthritis or severe, the definition of severe knee arthritis to me means you, you are not a candidate for um, regenerative medicine. Um, again, PRP and stem cells can be controversial and I know there are people and places where you can They'll inject your PRP or your stem cells if you like to pay for it, you know, whether you have severe knee arthritis or not. But I don't recommend that. I think that is uh, not a good use of your dollar. Uh, I think we can have better options for you um, and probably a semi-good transition to this. But the re relative comorbidity is severity of disease and other blood 
issues. If you're on certain blood thinners or other issues, there can be sometimes reasons we wouldn't do it because we, we don't want to stop your blood thinner. Um, but many, most people are candidates for PRP if they do not have bone, uh, excuse me, bone on bone arthritis. We're, go ahead. Question for yeah. you. You know, I always hear in the office people that are looking at stem cell injections. Mm -hmm. Um, or PRP injections, and a lot of people, I think, have a misconception that they think this is going to regrow their cartilage mm -hmm. or regenerate their knee. Absolutely. So what do you tell patients that are looking for these regenerative therapies of what, what is this actually going to do for them? And in the arthritic range, who's probably a good candidate and who is it probably not really worth their time? Excellent question. And I should probably go back to these slides since we're talking about them. So PRP, for example, what I discuss with patients is we have no studies that show regrowth of cartilage. We are not regrowing cartilage. We're not increasing the size and space in the joint with new cartilage. I think of it as we are increasing the health of the joint. And there is some microscopic healing of, as we saw in that uh, early cartoon where there's exposed bone, we are calming the inflammation of the joint. We are probably... Um, the belief is we are taking these healing growth cells from the body and trying to give a layer of healing to those exposed layers of bone and tissue that are extremely inflamed and irritated. And we're seeing improvement in the range of one year out for these PRP and stem cell patients. There's but that is improvement in pain. Correct. Improvement in symptoms. But this not symptom improvement pain. in their cartilage. So correct. a lot of things I think for people to take home for this is that these are good treatments for appropriate Absolutely. patients, yep. but a lot of these treatments are, are, are meant for pain and comfort, Absolutely. but it's not going to fix Correct. your knee. Yep. Absolutely. And you just asked about the candidates. I really find that, <clears throat> excuse me, the younger patient population, more active, PRP is an excellent option as a younger person because we want to stay away from the cortisone shots. We want to stay away from things that are toxic to your joint. Mm -hmm. and I really feel like that's something... There are many subspecialists across internationally that think that PRP should be one of our earliest interventions mm -hmm. instead of it being towards the end. We're very backwards. And the problem is, is well, a cortisone shot's super cheap, so why not do it first? Well, if it's slightly toxic for your joint, why aren't we jumping to PRP as an early intervention to help with the health and comfort of your joint early right. to reduce symptoms, like you're saying, and get them into physical therapy and get the joint moving um, and kind of help their overall health earlier. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, this is obviously still an ongoing, growing field. And I really feel like the, the positive um, momentum for PRP is exciting for the field of non-surgical orthopedics and orthopedics in knee, for knee treatment in general, I think. Um, there are many places around the country that are recommending a series of three PRPs. There is evidence that that's better than one. Um, however, we don't have enough evidence to support that because it's an out-of-pocket cost. So routinely, I recommend one. We see how it goes, and then we can move on if they need others. But again, all of your things, it's still patient selection. Correct. And these are things, you as the patients who are out there on the chat and uh, listening in tonight, this is something to talk to your primary care doctor or your sports medicine specialist or your orthopedic surgeon about. And these are all excellent questions. Thank you for bringing them up. No problem. I want to finish out here our last couple slides. So, and maybe this is a little bit of a good transition, I think, to Dr. Maynard's talk about knee replacement. So genicular nerve block and ablation is an excellent, um, like I was saying, transition here because if you have failed all of these management options and either you can't have a knee replacement because, as Michelle was going through, if your BMI is too high and you don't qualify for a knee replacement yet, or if you are way too young for a knee replacement, or if you're way too old, and Dr. Maynard will go through all the different um, appropriate indications for knee replacement, I'm sure, shortly. Um, but a nerve block, if you have failed everything, is an excellent option to reduce pain. Again, just reducing symptoms. This does not fix the problem, but it can obviously help reduce discomfort in a patient who cannot have a knee replacement or even potentially post-knee replacement uh, chronic pain. So this is an option we, we were running low on time for the non-surgical section here. But one additional option, not, this is not an early one. This is the opposite of what we were talking about with some of the early interventions, but a, a last intervention that could be considered if nothing else is working for you. When to see a specialist. Um, so again, these are kind of common questions I get asked by patients as well as physicians and other sub-specialists. Like when should they send a patient to Dr. Maynard or to myself or to other people? 
So I say for non-surgical cases, obviously I want you to work with your primary care doctor and start with the basics, but basically if you've failed physical therapy or other medicines and or injections, or if you're not a surgical candidate for other reasons, you can see a, a non-surgical uh, orthopedic specialist such as myself. Obviously, there are indications for surgery. If, you're, if the joint is truly unstable, significant mechanical symptoms, failed all the other non-surgical management or other fracture management, very important to see one of my surgical colleagues um, for some of these more complex issues. Um, I have a, a, fr a frequently asked uh, questions for PRP and stem cells like Dr. Maynard had brought up that we can uh, probably provide to patients if they like. But this is kind of a brief summary of the most important frequently asked questions. Um, the impact on the patient life determines the severity of the OA, not necessarily the x-rays. I tell patients in my office all the time, we treat people, not pictures, right? It's very important to focus on the symptoms and help get the patient better. Um, if you get x-rays, um, if you're coming to see Dr. Maynard or myself, we are always wanting to ideally see weight-bearing x-rays. So that's something, if you're getting knee x-rays, we want to see how that knee really looks. Um, if you have significant arthritis, we don't need an MRI. Um, and Dr. Maynard can go into that on his thoughts on it. But in general, um, all knee arthritis has meniscus tearing and damage. We don't need to be looking for that necessarily. I have patients coming and asking for MRIs all the time, which is why I involve it here. Um, basically, physical therapy does have major benefits, and we can talk about that if needed. We talked about weight loss already. Steroid injections, we talked about at maximum, we hope for three times a year, and do have options and benefits for short-term relief. Arthroscopic stuff we didn't get into as much, but we don't recommend routine clean-out surgeries. People will ask about those commonly. Um, that is not a recommended uh, option for patients. And regenerative medicine does not, there you go right there, Dr. Maynard, regenerative medicine or regenerative therapy do not regrow cartilage. And we say not yet anyway, because this is obviously a continuing moving forward field, uh, but at the same time, we want to treat symptoms and help people feel better, but it does not regrow cartilage. That is the end. I think we kind of went through a good number of questions, but Michelle, was there anything else that you saw there that we need to do? Just a typical out-of-pocket cost. Sure. So um, is one typical. Typical, we'll say. <laughs> typical. Uh, there's yes. a wide range of costs. Uh -huh. I will say here at Ohio Health, um, and in my office in particular, PRP is $485. And that includes everything we do um, in that visit, mm -hmm. including the blood draw, including the injection, and everything in okay. and out the door for the actual PRP. For stem cell injections here at Ohio Health, they're approximately $2,800. Um, I know lots of other locations where I've heard anywhere from 4000 to 10000 per per stem cell treatment. Um, it can be regional. It can be facility driven. There's lots of reasons for different costs. Um, so you need to talk to your provider specifically. But a general discussion is it's a couple hundred, hundreds of dollars for PRP, thousands of dollars for stem cell. Very good. Okay. So I think we got through most of the questions. So we're going to go move on to Dr. Maynard's talk. So let's get to, so we, uh, I'll let him, his brief introduction is he is a knee and hip replacement specialist at the Bone and Joint Center down at Grant. And um, I'll let him go into his talk about robotic assisted knee replacement options and orthopedic surgery insight to all of this now. All right. Hi, everyone. So what we'll do is I'll talk briefly on arthritis, but I'm not going to kind of rehash everything because Ben's covered a lot of things already. And then, you know, in what I can do in 10 minutes time, I want to at least scratch the surface so people can get an idea about ro robotic assisted knee replacements are because I'm sure people are hearing a lot about that. And what does that mean? What does that look like? Obviously, this can't be an all encompassing talk for about 10 minutes. OK, but we encourage your questions. So when we look at knee arthritis, almost half of people are going to have symptomatic osteoarthritis in their knees at some point in their lifetime. According to our own American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, knee arthritis is the most common form of arthritis and a leading cause of disability worldwide. As Ben touched on, treatments for knee arthritis are weight loss, anti-inflammatory medications, therapy, activities, different types of injections, and then lastly, we have surgical procedures that are generally reserved for patients whose arthritis is severe and unresponsive to typical non-surgical treatments. So this is a robotic device to replace knees, and this is just kind of giving you a picture to see. You can see a base. There's a robotic arm here um, that we use. It's got several articulating joints to help us do the surgery. And then there's always, with all robotic assist devices, some type of a base it communicates with and another computer to help control it. When we look at, 
first talking about partial knee replacements, we look at knee arthritis and you've got early people who have a little bit of arthritis, maybe a little meniscus tear, things of that nature, and they're well treated with conservative care, maybe a knee arthroscopy or a scope to remove part of their meniscus. Then we've got people on the other end of the spectrum who have severe end-stage arthritis throughout the entire knee, and those are people we talk about for total knee. And then somewhere in the middle, we have this mid-stage arthritis. And I always tell people the knee has three parts. There's between the femur and the tibia bone on the inside of the knee, the same deal on the outside of the knee, and on the underneath the kneecap. And if someone has just arthritis, in one of those three parts, and the other two thirds of their knee is fine or relatively good, then they may be potentially a candidate for only having part of their knee replaced. When we look at partial knee replacements historically, they haven't had the greatest track record. And some of that is, it's not necessarily because the procedure is, is not as good, um, one aspect for having a partial knee that goes bad is because, well, two-thirds of the knee is still yours. And if arthritis continues, then this may be a procedure that bridges you to later on in life getting a total knee. And so obviously that is a failure because eventually it converts to a total knee if the arthritis progresses. But there's also another pitfall, and that is mechanically putting it in wrong, having um, complication rates during a surgeon's learning curve and making this a reproducible surgery so that it's right 100% of the time. And traditional guides and jigs to do this um, in people who didn't do many of these did show that this could potentially lead to some increased failures in, in this type of knee replacement. And there's definitely a little bit higher failure rate of partial knees compared to total knee and some of that can be related to this. When we look at some of these failures, so this was a patient that gets sent to me on their right knee with the partial knee. I'm sorry, they don't have pointers for us. But when this partial knee got put in, it got put in too thick. And because it was put in too thick, it pushed the knee out to the side. And so it caused someone to go from being bow-legged to being knock-kneed. And by changing that alignment, it caused the outer side of their knee to wear out. And you can see on that x-ray, now that patient's knee is kind of tilted to the side and they're bone on bone. And because of that complication and wearing out, now as you can see on the right side of radiograph, you have to do a surgical revision and convert them to a total knee to replace, to fix this. So we want to avoid doing that when we do the partial knee replacement. So what are some of the reasons we get a partial knee replacement? Well, it's kind of things that everyone usually knows of when we talk about knee replacement. It's I have pain with weight bearing. I have pain on just one side of my joint, not necessarily all over. Um, on x-rays, the other two of the three compartments that we talked about are normal. So if you look on the knee on the right side that does not have an implant on that x-ray, you can see the outer side of the knee has excellent appearing joint space. Only the inside of the knee is bone on bone. If someone has a deformity in their knee, usually people become um, bow-legged or knock kneed you want that deformity to be a little bit uh, correctable. You don't want it to be rigid and fixed. If someone has contractures in their knee um, where they don't have as much knee range of motion, you don't want those contractures to be significant because we can't fix or address those with a partial knee. That's better addressed with a total knee. Lastly, you want to address people with osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis. That's mainly the arthritis we've been talking about tonight. But there is a whole conglomerate of patients with rheumatologic conditions, rheumatoid arthritis. Those are more systemic diseases, and that affects the entire joint. So partial replacements in, in, in patients with those conditions aren't a good idea. When we look at robotic surgery, why would we do it? Well, what this is going to help do for the surgeon, in my opinion, is that we're going to gain excessive knowledge in preoperative planning for the patient. We're going to know what's going to happen in the game before we play it. And then we're going to have 3D input through a robot and through imaging to help guide us and make more intelligent interoperative decisions, which then between the surgeon and interaction with the robotic arm hopefully means that we end up with a patient with a better lined up joint, which ends increase their satisfaction. So briefly, when we talk about robotic surgery, what we do, it's a little different than a regular joint replacement. We're going to get a CAT scan of their knee. I put that into a computer program, and I make a perfect exact 3D model of their knee. That 3D model improves our visualization 
of that knee and understanding what we're getting into. And then on that model, I'm gonna put all the implants on it and align it, size it, and make it all like the surgery is already done before we even go to the OR. Then when we get to the OR, well, knees are a dynamic thing, they move. Um, some knees are loose, some knees are tight, some people are bow-legged, some people are knock knee. so there's soft tissue balance. When we're in the OR, we can then assess the soft tissue balance, and then to truly balance that knee replacement, we can then alter the components real time before we even do any bone removal. And then once we accept the plan, then the surgical procedure is essentially done even though we haven't even removed any bone yet. Then we bring in a robotic arm and complete the actual procedure um, that we plan. So the robot is as good as what we tell it to do. So this is a video showing um, the robotic arm that we have with Ohio Health. You can see that's the base and then the uh, part that's moving there is the arm that has a high-speed burr on the end of it for the partial knee replacements. Um, this is just a cartoon showing the CT scans that we get creating a 3D model of the knee. And then you can see they're stressing this knee, showing you how certain knees will give. And this changes the spaces and the gaps in the knee. And we can map that out in the OR and make sure that with where we place the implants, everything is even and tracking well. Once we accept the plan, I bring in the burr. As you can see on the right side, you can see the cartoon there showing the map layout. I'm the one that uses the burr, I'm the one that does the burring, but the robotic arm won't let me go outside those plan lines for the implant. So I can't color outside the lines and the only bone I'm gonna remove is what we said we were gonna do from the patient specific plan that we created. Then we put the implants in place for just part of the knee for the partial and then we're done. And we make sure that the knee has full range of motion. Dr. Maynard, we may get to this, but do you use a tourniquet is one of the questions? I do most of the time, sometimes okay. I don't. Um, there's been a lot of re literature out. Some people say that it decreases pain. A lot of other studies have come out and shown that it has not. Um, it really kind of is patient dependent, okay? Um, also, there's not a really good consensus out too, because a lot of these are bound with cement. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have a clean, dry surface to cement into, could possibly down the road, that cement man will be worse. And I don't know that we truly have an answer for that yet. So this is some of the studies showing that basically with robotic surgery versus traditional guides and jigs for at least partial knee replacements, we're at least two to three times more accurate and reproducible in doing that surgery. And that means there's fewer outliers than doing it with manual knees, which hopefully then translate to hopefully fewer failures that require a revision. So this is a patient of my own. You can see the inside of both their knees is bone on bone. They're bow legged. The rest of their knee does not have significant arthritis. They underwent bilateral um, partial knee replacement and we've corrected their alignment. You can see the knee is more straight. The implants are in perfect position. And I think that's another perfect thing about this is it's not making sure that you've done the surgery great 80, 90% of the time. It's making sure that you do the surgery great 100% of the time and that it's reproducible. And so this patient just had some in-home therapy for a couple weeks and actually didn't even do outpatient therapy. They were doing great. So typically post-operatively, people are up walking, um, with assistive device within hours of surgery. Um, for partial knees, most people go home the same day. If they have medical comorbidities, sometimes they may stay overnight. Typically, either do in-home physical therapy or they can start outpatient therapy right away. We give them some anti-inflammatory medications, a small amount of pain prescription, and then we do provide anticoagulation to prevent a blood clot in the leg. So that is partial knee. Now, total knee is kind of the same flavor, okay? It's just a little bit different workflow and a different robotic attachment. So I won't go through just as much stuff. I'll kind of walk you, it's easier to kind of walk you through a little video of it. So the same thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get a CAT scan and we're gonna make a 3D model of the patient's knee and calculate limb alignment. And this is just, I guess the uh, video is slower than me. But so once again, showing you getting that 3D model here And then once we have that 3D model, 
I can then take that and based on where we would normally make resections in a knee replacement, I can put a total knee replacement up and then I can put different sizes, um, I can shift the implant and really put that with that good 3D image exactly where I think it probably should go and it's all done before we, you know, a week or more before we ever even hit the OR. Then once we're in surgery, I do the surgical approach. Now I take this wand and I map all these little bony points in the end of the femur bone and we also do it into the tibia bone which is seen right here and that's the process of how we mate the actual patient to their preoperative plan. So we know with the robot where on them is where on the, the uh, patient. This is stressing the knee, checking the dynamic stability. You can see in the computer program it measures the, the thickness and then I can alter the implants to give them a patient specific uh, information. Then we bring in a robotic arm. You can see this is the top of the tibia bone. I use the saw. I control the saw, but the saw is locked in the plane of the cut. You can see a guide around there. It will not allow me to cut outside the lines. You cannot put the saw too far back, so you can't endanger the main artery and nerve and vein back there. So it's very safe. Then we put the knee implant in place once we've completed all of our cuts. And that's how we, that's just a slight difference. So really the big thing is, is replacing the whole knee and we're using a saw instead of a high speed burr at that time. So you can see with this kind of technology, we get a lot more information and it can take even this terrible knee that was in my office, you can see the tibia is literally almost shifted half the way over. And by balancing this out and planning these cuts preoperatively and interoperatively, able to align their knee and give them a primary knee replacement as opposed to some type of revision surgery. Here's another patient with just absolutely destroyed knees. Um, once again, this is from a post-traumatic injuries, but once again, with this robot, we're able to really key in what are the, the tightnesses, laxities of the knee, size this up for the patient, and once again, get away with the primary knee replacement. So it really is a, a strong technology, in my opinion. So just like with partial knees, we get people up walking same day. We do a lot of people as an outpatient. There's a lot of people who will stay um, maybe 24 hours just overnight. Um, the therapy protocols, everything is very similar to a partial knee, but people are a little more painful with a total knee. So they're maybe just a little further behind. Same anti-inflammatory medication. Um, and then uh, once again, always anticoagulation to prevent blood clot. So I know this is kind of really fast, kind of quick and dirty, taking you through robotic assisted knee replacement, but it's really kind of to get you to see what do these things look like? How could we use them? How does that help us do a better job for the patient? So that's all I got to say. Excellent, Dr. Yeah. Maynard, thank you. Yeah. Um, there were a couple questions for you during the talk and um, just for everyone who's uh, hanging with us here, we are gonna extend the time frame just a little bit because there's been a lot of really good questions and we'll do a kind of a round table discussion of answering multiple of the questions that haven't been answered so far. But to, to kind of wrap up your talk, Dr. Maynard, I thought a good question that just came through recently was, is robotic knee replacement covered by insurance? So a knee replacement is a knee replacement. There's codes for every surgery. So whether I do your surgery with a robot or manually, um, it's the same code. The only additional cost is with a primary joint replacement without a robot, I'm not gonna get that CT scan. And so that is something we get approved through insurance, probably, I don't know, maybe four or five times a year, I get an insurance that will not approve that. And that comes down to patients can then still get that and there's a out of pocket fee for that. But if they're approved for joint replacement through their insurance, they can have robotic or not, okay? Um, and I spoke on the, um, arthroscopic surgeries mm -hmm. uh, briefly in my discussion, but someone asked, when is, um, or is arthroscopic surgery an option for patients? So there, there's, honestly, I would say it's probably been over the last five years, there's really been a paradigm shift um, to get away from doing surgery to clean out the knee, is what you'll hear a lot of people say, because it's really kind of a lie. Um, if you go in and scrape someone's arthritis, well, guess what? The arthritis is still there. They may trim off loose pieces of cartilage, but it's still arthritic. And so they did a lot of studies first starting out in Europe, and they showed that 
patients that have degenerative meniscus tears with degenerative arthritis and they scope those people. That um, those people were essentially doing this just as well or just that whatever you want to say as someone who had conservative non-operative care at a year out. So we kind of get away from that. But patients with mechanical symptoms, catching, locking, um, don't have much arthritis but have meniscus tears. Those are all people that we do knee arthroscopy on um, and intervene in that way, but we definitely have gotten away from it compared to where we were over five years ago. And I can ask a question from our chat. Does a total knee last a lifetime? So how long is the life expectancy? It depends on how yes. long the life is. <laughs> so I don't mean to sound crude with that, but it is a dumb, fake, man-made mechanical part. There's not a single thing that you can buy, not a single pair of shoes you can buy that aren't going to wear out. Knee replacements are going to wear out. My canned answer I give people is I hope they get 10 years. I've seen them last 15 to 20. Um, we know that obesity is um, potential increased risk for earlier failures. We know that people can get infections. You know, if we look at a knee replacement and we go, I'm, I'm kind of summarizing lots of data here, but if you go, okay, let's look at 10 years, you're gonna have mid to low 90% of people still have their knee replacement. You got a couple got infected at some point, some people had some trauma, and maybe some got loose. We go to 15 years, now we're in the 80% range. We go to 20 years, now the data is down in the 70s, but now the data starts getting muddy because there's a lot of people that 20 years out aren't with us anymore. So it's kind of hard to say. But eventually, they will. likely will fail. There was another question. You're getting lots of, since you just had such a great talk, you're oh, getting lots great. of good questions here. <laughs> so what is your general, would you say, complete recovery time for patients post-replacement? So, you know, there's lots of recovery points. Mm -hmm. um, I would say at two weeks, a third of people are going to walk in on a walker, a third of people are going to walk in with a cane, and a third of people are going to walk in with nothing. Partial knee replacements off that stuff faster. By six weeks, usually there's a straggler or two still on a cane. You should have full range of motion. Your knee will still be sore and puffy. You will see people are back to work between four to six weeks to three months. The three months range is on the extreme for you know, manual laborers, constructors, people working on the roof, you know, going up and down ladders versus desk type people earlier on. Um, rapid improvements will be seen in knee replacement for the first three to four months. You will truly see improvement for about a year. But the last that half that year is, you know, I'm not as achy for standing long periods of the time. I can take multiple flights of stairs, gaining strength and endurance. And it also depends, too, is how debilitated was the patient before surgery? Because if someone can hardly walk and they haven't been able to hardly walk for a year, just because I give them a new knee doesn't mean they're going to skip down the hallway. They're, they're debilitated. They have to rehab surgery and... Um, rehabilitate their muscle and function. So it all depends too, is what did you put into the equation? Right. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had two people actually bring this up in the chat, so I think it's a good one to address. Um, are there restrictions for osteoporosis or how did, does osteoporosis play into them being qualified for a knee replacement? So um, osteoporosis does not really restrict people from a knee replacement. Um, it does carry with it risk, depending on how bad the osteoporosis is, um, because that bone is the foundation of what, you know, I'm hanging my picture on, the picture being the, the total knee. We've got to implant that, and we have to gain fixation. Sometimes, you, if the osteoporosis is really bad, we might have to use stems or get a bigger anchor. Um, I would tell you that with the robotic knee replacements, we do have to put a couple pins in the bone, and... Um, there are a very low reported rates of fracture through those pin sites. I've never seen that personally, but I wouldn't go putting a pin through someone who has weak bone. I would do a more traditional knee. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, um, it, obviously it's possible to get uh, increased likelihood of periprosthetic fracture, but, you know, it's still not common. And that might transition into one of the other good questions I see here is um, someone was asking about, uh, pros and cons of robotic versus manual, more traditional knee replacement. And you mentioned there that maybe yeah, if so osteoporosis think, would be the big, The big one for me is the pins. There's a couple pins we put in the tibia bone and we put a sensor array. Every bone you work on with navigation has to have a point of reference, almost like I always tell people it's my cell phone tower. 
and everything triangulates through that. And that's how we make the robot know when I'm operating it, where on you is where on the plan. And those pin sites are not a big deal. I've never seen a fracture through them. However, if I have a 70-year-old female with osteoporosis and small bone, I'm not going to do this. Because really, in all this stuff, whether it's new technology or anything, you have to see the forest through the trees. What is best for that patient, and what is the best way that I can bring them through their episode of care with the lowest amount of risk? And so those are that's the main risk that I wouldn't do would be um, that poor bone quality. I get this question sometimes as a kind of a sports medicine specialist. People will ask, what are the jogging, high impact exercise recommendations post knee replacement? So I would tell people that once again, you got a dumb fake man-made mechanical part in you. Every pounding that you do could potentially wear it out faster. With that being said, there are people that run on them, but you are rolling the dice a little bit. It may wear out faster. I think non-impact activity, biking, walking, elliptical, skiing, all these things to your heart's content. If you like to go play softball on the weekend um, in some intramural league and you want to jog the bases, okay. But don't go outside multiple days a week and go try to run a mile or two. That repetitive beating I just do not think is good for a joint replacement. All very good information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question about kneecap arthritis, and maybe we can work together on this one, Dr. Maynard. But mm -hmm. um, I find, so we call it the patellofemoral joint for mm -hmm. anyone who get, maybe gets that on their paperwork from their doctor or family medicine um, specialist. So the kneecap um, or the patella, you can get arthritis behind that and can cause pain for lots of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Dr. Maynard mentioned earlier, there's actually three compartments of the knee. We talk about, and he had some very good x-rays Dr. Maynard did on his presentation, where you saw the inside and the outside of the knee is the two main weight-bearing compartments. Mm -hmm. But there is the third compartment, which is where that kneecap slides up and down. You can kind of feel as, as you're sitting at home, you can kind of move your knee back and forth through that kneecap, kind of sliding through the groove there kind of separate from the rest of the joint, but it is part, it's the third compartment of the knee. Mm -hmm. So there are many good non-surgical treatments for kneecap arthritis. Um, uh, and Dr. Maynard, there are, I know there's some implants and maybe you can discuss, you know, patellofemoral yeah, stuff, but. Um, I think, you know, with standard treatment, obviously would go through the recommendations that you went through with your talk. And then when we got these patients, these patients are typically, you know, stairs, prolonged sitting, going to stand, uneven ground, they're going to have this diffuse anterior base knee pain because those are positions that really grind that kneecap down. And we do have a partial replacement option for that. We can do that robotically and actually doing it robotically is excellent because the kneecap goes through transition. And when I use it with the robot, I can actually align the implant perfectly to that patient's groove in their femur that the kneecap rides in, and then I can alter the implant to end at the level of the surrounding areas that actually have cartilage. So it's a smooth, seamless transition, um, and so it really customizes it, and uh, there are people that get patellofemoral replacements um, if there's not arthritis in the other parts of the joint, and they're very pleased with them, and that's actually one joint replacement because it's in that patellofemoral compartment. It's non-weight-bearing. That's when I tell people you can run on this, you can jump on this, you can do whatever you want because none of the weight of doing that is going through that joint replacement. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I looked back up a ways and there was, I think, two or three questions on the chicken collagen injections <laughs> oh, or yeah. animal-based <laughs> products. Um, that We do get this question very frequently in the office. So the very early and I, the title that I used was visco supplement injections. Mm -hmm. These are also, like I said, known as the gel injections. Some people call them the rooster comb injections mm -hmm. or the chicken shots. There's lots of fun names, I'm sure. Yep. Dr. Maynard has heard them all in his office. Yep. Probably Michelle, too, with, with her nursing stuff, too. But all I'll say is, is that, yes, the very early injections did have a avian or chicken-based protein that mm -hmm. they found um, the chemical compound as similar to human cartilage to kind of kind of stimulate the joint to kind of help lubricate the joint. Mm -hmm. They did find that some humans, not surprisingly, had an allergic reaction to these. So a high percentage of the newer injections do not have the avian or chicken-based protein mm -hmm. in the injection. So our allergic reaction rate has gone dramatically down with Correct. these. 
However, I will say, and one person did put it in the question, mm -hmm. Paul will give you a shout out, what about hyaluronidase injections? So the basic chemical component of these injections is hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. That is a chemical that helps the joint and the what's called the synovial fluid of the joint lubricate and help the knee move and help reduce pain. So to summarize, many of these questions, um, people asking about the chicken shot, that is a re reference to the Visco supplements um, that I referenced in my uh, And I would talk. tag along with that because there's this pet peeve of mine because there's this commercial going on right now. Okay. I think it's almost always during the local news. Okay. And they show this cartoon of gel injections going in and the injection gets squirted in the knee on the cartoon yeah. and then the joint miraculously separates and now there's space. And so this is a misconception. It's, it's not going to give you space in your knee. I could put that injection in your knee, take an x-ray before and after, and the x-ray is going to look just the same. So a lot of people, you know, I, I think another point of some of these talks is that people walk away and realize, oh, this is what it really does. Right. You know, and, and no, it's more of a lube job. It's not going to create space in your knee like that common commercial. It, drives me nuts when I see that commercial. Absolutely. I, I do get that. Uh, people say, is there a foam that you fill up the knee? And I think it's more from the commercials that they see it. Yes. <laughs> There's yes. no uh, foam that we're using unless that's a, a research that I have not seen. Um, but the gels with the common yes, one you're discussing. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I do apologize. Uh, Celeste wrote in there, can we elaborate on younger patients? I think I mentioned, you know, uh, for younger patients. Um, all I'll say is, is yes, it, it, it's all relative, right? Um, uh, high school athletes, College athletes, you know, we say weekend warriors in the 20 to 40 or 50 mm -hmm. year old range is very different from 65 and up. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, obviously, you know, my when I say younger patients, I would say anywhere from I see eight to 108. So I would say my younger athlete patients is really the 20s to 50s and then 60s and up is kind of the range where we would discuss other alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, in general, because Dr. Maynard's excellent videos with showing us knee replacement options that are improving and doing so well these days, um, knee replacements used to be, in general, from, from my perspective, kind of a 60 and up discussion. Yeah. But I know that with the, the in, increased improvement in duration of ability of the hardware yeah. lasting longer, that's even extending. Is that right? I, I think so. And the, you know, the other thing that always gets me is everyone has heard from someone along the way is, Someone told me to not get my knee replaced until I couldn't take it anymore, okay? And for most people, that's true. However, when you look at arthritis, people will start developing deformities. As these deformities get worse, when they're bow-legged or knock-kneed, ligaments will get contracted, ligaments will get stretched out, and sometimes they get beyond what we can do with regular knee replacements. And then it doesn't mean they can't get knee replacement, but now we have to start using revision components. And the fear is, are these more constrained components that help stabilize this knee going to last as long as a regular primary knee? And, you know, or if I start seeing someone eroding away bone as opposed to not just being bone on bone. So I think if you have bad arthritis, it's worth seeing a specialist to see where you stand because not always is it good to wait till you can't take it anymore because the more dysfunctional that knee is, the more is going to have to be done with surgery, and a lot of times the, the more that might be to rehab it. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, you need to have significant arthritis before you do this. Um, you don't want to be intervening when it's too early either. Excellent thoughts. Um, I, we're just about out of time. We're really running it onto the, up on the hour. There's many, many other good additional questions in the chat, um, and uh, we will try to get to those, and someone from uh, our group will try to respond to everyone as much as we can. But thank you so much for your time, Michelle, yep. Dr. You. Maynard. Yep. Really thank you so much for all of your, uh, your time this evening. And everyone who joined and gave excellent questions in the chat, we appreciate your time as well. There's a slide here there for information if you need anything from any of us. And uh, thank you so much, and hopefully this was helpful. If you have any feedback, um, we'd love for future sessions. We'll try to do some of these again in the future. Thank you so much for your time, and everyone have a good night. Good night. Good night.